Well, Intel Coffee Lake is upon us. If you're living under a rock, that's the eighth generation. Core i7, i5, i3, CPU, SOC 1151, but not backward compatible with the sixth and the seventh generation Intel CPUs, Skylake and KB Lake by their code name, if you prefer. This is the Z370 Gaming i7 Professional. Professional Gaming i7, Professional Gaming. Gaming professional, I don't, it's more professional than gaming, let me tell you. Uh, this motherboard is one of the pricier Z370 motherboards, but one of the big features, one of the big draws on this motherboard, 10 gigabit ethernet, yes. Hmm, let's do a deep dive. So this motherboard, if you didn't see our other review, we also reviewed an ASRock Z370 uh, Gaming K6 motherboard. It's very, very similar to this motherboard. A very similar power delivery system, very similar armored uh, expansion slots, but this motherboard is a significant upgrade over that motherboard, mainly bringing 10 gigabit Aquantia Ethernet. Yes, onboard 10 gigabit on the Z370 platform. This is great, and this is not even the most expensive Z370 motherboard that I've seen. Um, as of the time of this video, it's about 270, 280 on Newegg. I have a feeling that the price may go up slightly if there's a significant market for 10 gigabit ethernet, because yeah, if you get a PCI Express 10 gigabit ethernet adapter, that's like 150 bucks minimum. Like the crazy Chinese old school uh, X540 Intels that are basically like remanufactured Intel X540 uh, network cards, which I don't recommend without some 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 asterisks, some stars, some footnotes. Uh, yeah, those cards alone are like 150 bucks, but this motherboard is only like $100 more expensive, and you get an Aquantia 10 gigabit NIC. So, wow. Okay, let's start by taking a look at the connectors and doing the usual stuff, and then uh, we'll dive into features specific to this motherboard. At the top edge of the motherboard, we've got an eight pin CPU power connector. We've got our four pin fan header. We've got another four pin fan header right behind the four DDR4 DIMM slots. At the front edge of the motherboard, we've got our XMP on off switch. So XMP, extreme memory profile. You're scared to death of UEFI. I think the joke that I made in the last video is UEFI-itis. Remove the switch to a slightly different location. But if you turn that switch on, it'll automatically use the XMP profiles that are on your memory sticks. You'll get the, the performance benefit, the speed benefit from that. There's absolutely no reason not to turn XMP on. It should totally work and be completely fine. So, I don't know. Then we've got front panel USB 3.0, that's USB 3.1 Gen 1, the protocol. Our front panel USB-C connector, another right angle USB 3.0, USB 3.1 Gen 1, the protocol. Eight six gigabit per second SATA ports, all of which are right angle. And then we've got the bottom edge connector of the motherboard. But I will say that there's a physical power and reset button, which is nice. There's also a diagnostic code readout LED. So if your system's not booting, you can see what the code is, look it up in the manual. And it'll be basically good to go to figure out why it's not booting exactly. At the bottom edge of the motherboard, we've got our front panel audio connector. It is on an isolated part of the PCB. We'll come back to the audio solution in just a minute. We've got our clear CMOS jumper, our TPM header, a Thunderbolt header for an optional Thunderbolt add-in card. We've got three USB 2.0 headers for internal peripherals or anything else like that that you might run. Another four pin fan header, a four pin RGB header connector, and then our front panel connections, our front panel nonsense basically for the rest of the board. In the middle of the board, we've also got two more four pin fan headers, one just right behind the RAM and one you know, just above the graphics card. Now in terms of power delivery, as I said, it's almost identical to the gaming K6. It is slightly, slightly upgraded. We've got the same really awesome aluminum heat pipe assembly. We've got the same sort of 12 phase design. There's actually 14 chokes here. So 12 plus two ish, but the other two are for graphics. So that doesn't really count. 12 phase power delivery. It's more than ample for the overclocks that you're gonna get on Coffee Lake. We've got the same nice attractive chipset. I'm gonna do this. Look at that, I removed the plastic from the chipset. Isn't that nice? I think that's exceedingly nice. Now in terms of PCI Express layout and peripheral layouts, it is SLI capable or SLI is supported. SLI is officially, you know, an NVIDIA thing. So that means that this slot can run it by 16 or by eight by eight with the middle slot here. Uh, all three of these are armored and reinforced. The bottom slot is a PCI Express 3.0 by four, but it runs through the chipset. This motherboard has three M.2 slots, two of which are back to back here. You get another uh, M.2 slot there. Those are all 80 millimeter M.2. If you are gonna run a, a 110 millimeter M.2, you could do it, uh, but you would lose, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to run all three M.2s. It's just you'd have, you know, sort of one M.2 encroaching on the other M.2 space because you've got two M.2s on opposite sides, which is actually really pretty cool. I think that that's kind of a nice feature because 
I don't think most people would be running three M.2s. Now all the M.2s and the uh, PCI Express by four slot on the bottom, all that runs through the PCH. It is important to understand that the connection from the PCH, this, to the CPU, this interface is only a PCI Express by four connection. So if you're using a really insanely high performance NVMe, uh, or two in RAID, it's gonna bottleneck at around four gigabytes per second. So if you're running RAID 0 or RAID 1 M.2, just know that uh, it's gonna bottleneck at about four gigabytes per second if you are running RAID uh, you know, through the chipset. You can get an add-in card you know, and run it in the by 8 slot and go that route and that is an option, but at that point you're looking at software RAID um, or a different platform. So there you go. Now in terms of M.2 layout, this M.2 layout is pretty good. You can get pretty good airflow from this one at the front of the board and this one that's above your graphics card, especially if you're gonna have a tower cooler or something like that. You've also got two PCI Express by one slots. Now, it's again, just like the gaming K6, it's the little details on this motherboard. Look at that. Those expansion slots are open on the back. So if you're running like PCI Express by two connection, well, it'll still run at a by one connection. You can put those cards in these slots and they'll still work. Let's take a look at our rear IO. For a rear I.O., we've got our clear CMOS button, two USB 3.0, 3.1 Gen 1, the protocol, combo PS2 mouse and keyboard port. This is our wireless solution. It is an Intel-based wireless solution, but it's a maximum of 433 megabit. It does also support Bluetooth 4.3, so nice touch. You can built-in DisplayPort and HDMI for our integrated GPU. Then we've got two LAN connections, one of which is an I219 connection, and the other one is an I211 AT PCI Express add-in card wired on the motherboard. Then we've got our Asmedia USB 3.1 Gen 2 controller, one type A, one type C. Then we've got another USB 3.0, that's USB 3.1 Gen 1, the protocol, and our Aquantia 10 gig NIC, that's the red connector right above there. Then we have our sound solution, a Realtek ALC 1220 based solution. It is a 120 dB signal to noise ratio implementation. Sound Blaster Cinema 3 and Hishikon Fine Gold audio capacitors. Separate isolated part of the PCB, plane for power, that kind of stuff. If you're looking for the Sound Blaster suite of stuff, uh, that's what is bundled with this motherboard. So you get all the Sound Blaster Creative Labs functionality with this Realtek ALC 1220 based audio codec. Now, in terms of other bundled software, I think the most useful bundled software with the motherboard in terms of like gaming and other stuff is the macro software because you can actually use the macro for controlling um, how high of a resolution your, uh, well, not really, how responsive the mouse cursor is. It's not really technically a resolution thing, but you can set up a hotkey so that you change the mouse sensitivity on the fly, for example, inside a game, which is pretty neat. You can also set up other macro keys for inside games. So it's a pretty neat little software bundle there. Other than that, it's pretty much what you would expect um, from an ASRock board. The, the BIOS is the UEFI is pretty well put together. I did have to get an update on my UEFI to get the DDR4 memory to run past DDR4 3600. But once I got the update on there, I had no problems running DDR4 3600. The motherboard actually supports beyond DDR4 4000, but uh, I didn't have any memory kits available that were faster than DDR4 3600. I did have one kit that's DDR4 4000, but I didn't have a chance to test it in the motherboard before doing this video. But I was really happy that I got DDR4 3600 working on this motherboard with our i7 CPU, so our i7 8700K. So I think this motherboard is, uh, is really, I mean, with the addition of the 10 gig ethernet, it really sets it apart um, in terms of like the class of other motherboards that are available for the Z370 platform, especially if you've already bought into 10 gig infrastructure. Now, Aquantia is also making switches that are two and a half gig and five gig. Those are not available at the time of this video, but those should be a little more affordable than a 10 gig ethernet switch. So you can totally use that. The older 10 gig cards, like the Intel 10 gig cards that you might get on eBay, those are not gonna support the two and a half or five gig protocols, but the Aquantia does because it's a newer 10 gigabit chip. So it's a nice touch. Other features of this motherboard, just like the gaming K6, it has the Hyper B Clock 2 engine. So if you're using this motherboard with a locked CPU, you can still overclock it with base clock overclocking, at least until Intel adds something to the uh, UEFI, the microcode um, that's in the UEFI to try to stop you from doing that, at which time you have to modify your own UEFI to take out whatever special sauce they added and it turns into a mess. And I, I don't know. It was, if you plan to use a locked CPU, you know, with the 10 gig ethernet on this motherboard, that might still be okay. I mean, the value is still there. So it's, it's still an option for being able to use, uh, use this motherboard and get some, get some value out of it, even with a locked CPU. But 
I think my recommendation is probably the unlocked i5 CPU, maybe the locked i7 with some B-clock overclocking, maybe the unlocked i7, depending on you know what your particular flavor is for this. In terms of Linux compatibility, it's basically the identical story with the gaming K6. The Aquantia NIC is supported on Linux, at least as of kernel uh, 4.12, which is what I was using for the test, so I got to use a slightly newer kernel with this motherboard than, versus the gaming K6. All of the other peripherals worked as expected. The IOMMU group situation honestly is really good, except for if you want to run two GPUs in a by eight by eight configuration. Now for my test bench setup, had uh, one graphics card and then the Intel uh, X540 dual 10 gig ethernet added in just for giggles. And the, uh, the Intel 10 gig NIC and the graphics card in the by eight by eight slots, those were in the same IOMMU group. So uh, the iGPU, however, the built-in GPU is in a different one. So you could use the iGPU for the host and pass through an add-in graphics card, a single add-in graphics card to a virtual machine. But if you wanted to use an add-in graphics card for the host and pass through a second graphics card to your Linux virtual machine, that's not gonna fly. Other than those use cases, and hopefully Intel will fix that because that's an Intel thing. Other than those use cases, this motherboard was really solid on Linux. Um, I didn't have any problems with any of the add-in peripherals, even with the DDR4 3600, even with the XMP profiles, which is really saying a lot. Also, the Linux kernel that we're using is new enough to understand Coffee Lake, so it understood the turbo modes and things like that. If you have problems, I would suggest disabling the Turbo Boost 3.0 stuff or like the, you know, the higher end Turbo Boost things because that's usually what the issue is. But by and large, I didn't have any issues with it, so I wouldn't expect that you would either. And if you do, well, come to the level one forums and let us know because uh, information conquers all or something. I don't know. The only thing I really have to complain about on this motherboard are the rubber duck antennas. The wireless solution has these for antennas. You screw them in at the back of the motherboard. They're not really repositionable. If your computer is under a desk, especially a desk made of metal like mine is, um, not gonna work. You're gonna, you know, if you had antennas on a wire that you could sort of position the antenna somewhere else, it would work a little better. That said, you know, this is a 433 megabit solution um, on the wireless. You might want something that's slightly upgraded if you're gonna do something crazy. You know, it's like maybe you want like a like a three by three MIMO type deal. You could upgrade that, put it in the bottom slot. And it'll be all set. But it's really, the built-in Bluetooth is actually handy for headsets and, and other Bluetooth type connectivity. And the back of the, uh, back of the case antennas are fine for, for that use case. So I can't really complain that, that much about it. Honestly, I'm really impressed with the engineering and like the build quality. Just looking at little things uh, on the motherboard that I can with the, with the naked eye in terms of like, you know, how it's put together, the components, thickness, the amount of copper used that kind of thing. I've been pretty impressed with the engineering on these, especially, you know, even just little things like using spring retention on the VRM heatsink. Just the little things, just the little touches. Really, it's really, really pretty impressive piece of kit. In fact, we're gonna build, we're gonna do a build with this motherboard um, and uh, that'll be a different video. But yeah, I actually, we're gonna do a build with this, this motherboard and see how it goes because hey, 10 gig ethernet, i7. Sounds like that'll be our i7 test system. So. We'll see how that goes. Well, if I've missed anything or done anything horribly wrong, be sure to let me know at the Level 1 Text Forums because, hey, that's how I improve. Hopefully that's been a really quick and not insanely boring look at the Z370 Professional Gaming i7. This is definitely one of the more highly rated motherboards from Level 1 Text. Definitely worth a look, especially if you're invested in the 10 gig ethernet platform. That's a little bit too rich for your blood, be sure to check out the Gaming K6. It's basically the same motherboard, except without, you know, 10 gig ethernet and some of the other extras that you get on this motherboard. So, I don't know, all in all, pretty good. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you later.